Fred Merrill. And Jolie, the hip hop pipe from the Green Ghetto. Last for the open mic. And he's just wrote himself as technical assistant to Poetica. My apologies to the last two, to Sarah and David, the mic didn't work. It's, it's all my fault, and I just apologise. And we'll try not to do it again. Now it's time for our first featured poet of the night. A man whose reputation precedes him because he's won national slams, he's won the Glastonbury Festival Slam. He's involved with some of the most exciting and progressive poets in Britain, working collectively with people like Polar Bear. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, he's a poet and loads is happening for, and he's working with him. And some other people who hopefully at some time will come up to Poetica when we're really nice to Andy and he tells them how good it is to come up here. So we've got to be nice to him because he's well connected. But at the same time we've got to be honest, but that's not going to be a problem because he's a fantastic poet. And it's a very great pleasure to welcome him. He's travelled down from Leeds today and he's come to bring his lyrics to us. Please give a massive welcome for Andy Craven Griffiths. thinking. He probably walks around with his chest out and his head up, but you'd be wrong. I walk around looking at my feet so I don't trip over. So I'm quite clumsy and do some stupid things. I'll give you an example. On Tuesday, which this is completely true, on Tuesday I was doing a workshop at a school in Leeds. Turned up, got to the car park, went and parked, had my coat on and my bag and that, had my mic stands and all of that sort of thing in my back uh, seat of my car. Locked the front, which I have to do by the key. All the others you can push it in and, and shut. Uh, and then got my stuff out and locked the back and pushed it in and went to walk away and realised I'd trapped my coat and my jumper in the, in the uh, car door. Simple, I just opened the front and then unlock it and do that, but I couldn't reach the front. So in front of a, a massive car park full of teachers and children, this is like a pullover coat and jumper as well, I couldn't just slip it off. I had to climb out of my stuff like this. <laughs> put my stuff down and then go and do a workshop for the kids who just watched me do that and I can take it seriously. Uh, so that's just a little bit, now we know each other a little bit better, I feel like I can do some poems at you. Um, the first one I'm going to do is about my granddad um, and it's about my granddad who has Alzheimer's. Does everyone know what Alzheimer's is? Yeah, it's like a memory disease. It means you just can't remember the things you've done, especially what you most recently did. So this one's about my granddad. Uh, my granddad who has Alzheimer's. Does anyone know what Alzheimer's is? Good. You get the point. You get the point. Uh, it's called Grandad, and it goes like this. Can you hear me without the mic, by the way? Do I need to use it? Use the mic. Use it. Here's the mic. All right, cool. Since we were kids, you threw us fruit from the tree of your memory. Folding navy stories in red leaves and paper aeroplaning them down to us. And even though we'd heard them all before, they still astounded us. Like the day you turned 21, mind sweeping off of Borneo, hot on some birthday tops of rum, you jumped overboard, you said, I'm off, I'm getting out of it, and swum towards the shore. And we used to crowd round to request songs on the harmonica that you said you'd learned by listening to Larry Adler. You played Upside Down, the Jimi Hendrix of mouth organs. Blasting bar bar black sheep out while we were singing chorus. And when I was six and we played cards, sat beneath the apple tree, yours was the king of hearts, but you forgot. It wrecked my magic trick. You taught me that boxing was more like fencing than fighting, flicking your nose with your right as your left went like lightning. And you pointed out Keys Club where you first learned, and said that German champ hit you in the arm so you didn't get hurt. Because boxers were rushing too in the war. So any opponent he got was great to fight. But he said you didn't just fight, you could box. Back then, it was a gradual slowing. Actually knowing what was going on, but unable to turn it back, you'd say, I've got a problem with my memory, you see, but I hope it's a thing of the past. Or you'd point at me and say, I've seen you before. And we'd both laugh, until I realised you joked because you'd forgotten my name. And I hoped that somehow you'd remember it in a couple of days. Because you knew everyone from somewhere, but you always played it safe. I wasn't Andy, just a grandson who you told again and again about the pianist you learned swear words from as a kid. 
till I'm telling you the story or magically guessing bits. But you never told me, and I never asked you why you spoke to passers-by as family as new family passed you by. Who's Shiloh? You'd say. You see, it works from the back, eats away the recent first and swallows your youth last. She's Tanya's daughter, Grandad. Oh, I know Tan and Raph. And yeah, they're next to be forgotten. Still, you've got to laugh. Like how you accidentally stole that bar of chocolate that you pocketed before walking off without even knowing you'd forgotten it. Or how you ate Ginger's cat biscuits. You've got to laugh. Hearing her say they were Ginger's, but forgetting that he was a cat. Or how, even the other night, Nan said you turned to her in bed and asked who she was, where she lived, and even where she slept. Now you draw a fur gown her. As though there's so little left of your memory, it's taken the words from your tongue instead. Or as though your lips have forgotten all the shapes in your head. But then you get profound. Do you know what it's all about? I'm shocked. Pardon? What? But you miss what you've just said. Or rather, you don't miss it. Today, you can't remember the rules of chess, or what it's called. You can't use a knife and fork or a dress and think that life is your primary school. But if I sing, or just smile, you cry whilst you laugh. And then you feel something beyond memory or words, in that small instant, however long it lasts. And maybe that something is what it's all about, Grandad. Yeah, Alzheimer's, very sad, very sad. But also quite funny sometimes when your granddad eats cat biscuits and stuff like that. <laughs> in fact, when he first got it, uh, and he hadn't been diagnosed with Alzheimer's yet, he'd get up in the morning and he lived with his wife, my nan, and his mother-in-law, my nan's mum. And he'd get up and my nan would make him breakfast, he'd eat it and then she'd go off to work. And then his mother-in-law would get up, my great nan, and she'd make him breakfast. Would she say, have you had breakfast? He'd say no. Because he'd forgotten. <laughs> she'd make him breakfast, he'd eat that. She'd go out, get her hair done. My nan would come back at lunch, make him lunch, she'd eat that. And she'd go back to work. And my other nan would come home, ask if he'd had lunch. He'd say no, because he'd forgotten. <laughs> and it would be about seven hot meals a day. Uh, naturally put on a bit of weight. And his trousers didn't fit him anymore. But my nan was so confident in her regime that instead of thinking, oh, he's getting a bit fatter, she rang up the head office of Marks and Spencers to complain that they'd changed their sizing scheme. <laughs> So, Alzheimer's is for me. Uh, just looking at my set list, trying to remember what I'm doing. Yeah, um, I'm going to do a few poems about my family tonight. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of cover poems of my brother's and one of my dad's as well. Um, and this one's the first one of my brother. Um, someone else I work with along with Polar Bear, uh, in were Faze Adams and my brother is John Berkovich. This one of his poems, it's called Spaceman, goes like this. These are just going to be, the couple ones are going to be short ones, a bit of light relief from the long ones I'm doing. Spaceman. I'm a spaceman with a spaceman's face. I'm a spaceman and I'm lost in space. I'm a spaceman and I like my space. So give me some space, man. That's it. <laughs> Don't need to slap the short ones for two reasons. First of all, they're a bit short and it seems gratuitous. Second reason, he's not in, so you don't care if you're <laughs> And I think it's a bit bad taking applause for his poem. Uh, so yeah, that's by my brother, who's called John Berkovich. Uh, next up. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to do another one about um, my family, about my eldest brother. This isn't a brother who does poetry, this is a different one. First though, another example of how stupid I am. I don't just lock myself outside my car with my coat in it. Uh, once, when I was studying, Bangor, is it Bangor by the way, I know she's in Bangor. I could have saved myself a slightly embarrassing phone call earlier then when my mate Gaz rang me up uh, and said that he was coming around later with Jess, his girlfriend, was I going to be in? And I said, oh, I'm going to Bangor. <laughs> she was like, what? That's my girlfriend. <laughs> I was like, no, no, not Jess. I'm going to Bangor in Wales. You're not taking a Wales to Bangor. <laughs> It was a bit awkward. Anyway, another stupid thing I did. This one is that, today. <laughs> uh, when I was studying, Bangor is a university town, no? Yes. Yeah? When I was studying, my last year as a student, uh, this may be relevant to some of you, I was in the library, got my regular routine, went in, did a bit of studying in the morning, uh, ate a sandwich, ate a, a what are they called, M&M's, brownie, 
usually. Um, and then fell asleep for a while on the desk, had a little rest. Oh, pretty much at that angle, at a right angle, my stomach was bent. This meant that sometimes I'd burp in my sleep because it would force the air up because of the angle of my stomach. And I once woke up because I burped so hard. As I woke up, I thought it was a fire alarm. <laughs> jumped up and started running out, shouting the fire. <laughs> it was embarrassing. Um, so this next poem has got nothing to do with that. It's by my big brother called Raph. The first time that I got properly drunk. Goes like this. We dominate the pool. First foreign holiday with all or nearly all of us. A dozen recumbent kinsmen loving the ovenly sun as it sinks in and makes us tender, like slow roasting lambs, with relaxed, unclenched hands laid back on sun lounges. Shyla's taken her first steps on Spanish sands and tans proudest. Our pupils shrink in sync and tighten to let less light in. And by thinning and stretching the pigment in our irises, it brightens them. And smiles stay on faces even when we close our eyelids and no one's there to smile back. Emma gets up to get a drink. And as I rush over to push her in, a chain forms behind and in perfect order, Marcus shoves me into the water as I shove, as Raph shoves him too. The chain stops at Raph, you don't fuck with Raph, you don't ruin his shoes. <laughs> it happened with all the purpose of a synchronized swimming team and the grace of a hen party mooning people at a pink limousine. The kind of grace I'm facing tonight. First time on the lash, getting mashed through the big boys and no thought of the aftermath. I've been entrusted to Marcus and Raph. Except time is drink only half what they have, because I'm little. And Raph, well, Raph's always been my big brother. With shovels for hands, he can slouch to 6-8. His voice rumbles like the low notes of a double bass in a cave. He used to do bicep curls using me as a dumbbell. I'd cling to his wrist, or I'd get held by the ankle. Strongest man in the world, chest like an iron barrel, no kidding. I've seen him eat two loaves of bread in one sitting, with three cans of soup, amused but not satisfied by the seemingly endless depths of his titanic appetite. Food was always just fuel to my sibling juggernaut. No one's ever as big as Dad, despite what my brother thought. Dad once bustled him down the hall, tussling to the front door, to the foot of the stairs, this leery bravado filled Mr. Know-it-all. Rafford sneered at his tea. That's a meal. That's a snack. At the stairs, Dad had to climb three steps just to give him a slap. <laughs> All right, kiddo, says Raph. I snap back. Next bar, then. It's next door, but feels like a trek. Just going to the toilet's like walking on a train. The more I concentrate on my legs, the more the ground seems to sway. On my cheeks, on my lips, and I go in kind of numb. At least I can't taste the beer, though. Now it's just wetness on my tongue. So I move on to pints, abandoning the plan. I tell Raph, I can handle it. This boy's becoming a man. We shake hands. I proper love Raph. I knew he'd understand. By bar six, the drinks are barely wet in our lips and slip down gullets chased by shots of vodka, tequila, and something licorice. And now, we understand everything. <laughs> we are three wise men lecturing each other on the preposterousness of girls and then nodding and agreeing with our new philosopher selves. We are inspired minds brimming with enlightenment and stumbling round in bodies now surprisingly prone to violence until suddenly we're huddling over a table, practically cuddling. Marcus has departed, only me and Raph in the bar, pop some karaoke jokers as wannabe pub stars. But then it's our turn and we watch as words blur across the screen mumbling something through the verse until the chorus kicks in. Just the two of us. <laughs> we can make it if we try. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. <laughs> the sky. Just the two of us. You and I. And then I'm leant over the side of my hotel bed, turning my insides out as I retch myself empty, getting more nauseous from the stench. And as I rest between spasms, I hear Sean ask, ever the detective, are you being sick? <laughs> I answer, no. He says, well stop it. <laughs> Next morning, I'm timid. Raph gives me no sympathy. But it's all self-inflicted, so I don't deserve any. Although, I'll learn from it after three days of vomit. I didn't know my limit and I stepped well beyond it. It's the maids I feel sorry for, after my mess. Piles of the vile stuff, the smell's not gone yet. And I'm glad that Raph takes the mick.
Because what else are brothers for if not to offer you greasy food when you're barely managing water? Well, you went out a boy, he says, and came back a boy, didn't go. <laughs> but don't worry, kiddo, because it's happened to all of us. And I smile at the thought of the army of pines Raph must have fought against to have not only lost, but to have been bedridden. And I find I'm still smiling when he's gone downstairs to dinner. Another little cover poem for Light Relief. This one's by a friend of mine uh, called Byron Vincent, who's a very good poet. His name is actually Byron Vincent as well. His mum and dad didn't give him a choice about being a poet, really. Uh, and it's about Elton John's preferred choice of salad. It's a haiku, and it goes like this. I'll read it because I don't know it that well. Elton scorns lettuce, spits venom at vile lamb's leaf, He's a rocket man. <laughs> I love taking credit for other people's work. Yeah. Well, easy. That's what actors do. Right, uh, anyone in here ever heard a good chat up line? No. No? That's the best one you've heard. Yes or no? Is that a good one? No. no. No one had a good one, alright, well, I've never used one. And I was asked what I would what I'd say if I did have to use one, so I made some it up, I wrote it down. If anyone wants to write this down, any of the men in it, you know, you've got me a quick writer. They get a pen out and a bit of paper, and you can use it. If any of the girls get chatted up later using this line from another guy, know that it's mine. Really. <laughs> uh, it goes like this. Does anyone mind me directing this poem at them, by the way? Preferably a female. Doesn't matter who it is. Put your hand up, otherwise I might just pick you anyway and bully you. <laughs> Would you mind? I don't care, because I'm on stage and I've got the microphone, so I'm going to do it anyway. This one uh, is called Chat of Lime. It goes like this. If it's true that God made woman from a spare rib, you are sensual proof that we should all be atheists. You are mesmerising elegance, delicate sentience and penetrating strength. A pearl born of bivalve mollusks, you're a problem to which mankind's saving solution proves useless. Much deeper than a flesh wound, you're of this world, you're out of the orbit of ordinary splendidness. A wife beyond a groom, life beyond certain doom, the only human capable of conducting the moon with your womanhood. That perpetual bloom that moves oceans is deliciously loathsome and throws hope through closed moments able to change the past. Your hair is a stunning, endless black space, a blanket of Indian ink, and as you walk it pendulates hypnosis the whole world sinks into. You are a velvet epidemic of sophomore fakes and caramel smiles that we all crowd around to banquet on until we spew butterflies. We're paralysed by your presence and past caring about the future. Your incapacitating good looks scar indelible marks on my retina, and I reject the idea of cleaning them. The insides of my eyes are my cinema. Oozing sex, you drip jaw drops like <laughs> a tender, ripe succulence with an accent of voluptuous tongue hunger. You are the perfect curvature desirous man yearns. You give me fever. What a lovely way to burn. <laughs> I, I can't actually, I have to do it from the beginning otherwise I've got no idea where I am. Uh, also, I write all my lyrics on the insides of my eyelids and each time I blink, it cleans it like a power, uh, what are they called? Excellent. A presentation. And it brings us the next one. I can't go backwards, I'm afraid. Uh, next one. Um, I didn't know that my dad used to write poetry until I'd already yeah. started doing it and my brother did it already, that's why I started. Um, and when I started doing it, he said, oh yeah, I, wrote, I know a few poems. Uh, and he read a couple to me. And I'm going to do one now. It's a cover poem uh, from him. And it goes like this. Very short one. Candy floss, gossamer, and butterflies' wings are like lead since I touched your mind. And now I know why I go on fighting battles in a war I cannot win. I think that's about my mum. Uh, if it's not, I'm a little worried, actually. <laughs> Maybe it's about some woman that I've never heard of and never met. Um, another silly thing I did. 
Go on. Does everyone know what Skype is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like internet phone basically. Um, I was going out with a, an Irish girl and she lived partly in England, partly in Ireland. So when she was on uh, in Ireland, I'd ring her through Skype. Um, so I was on there, ringing her, started ringing, waiting for her to answer, and at the same time, someone started ringing me. So I was in a little dilemma. Do I try and answer that phone, say I'll ring you back in a bit and hang up, or answer it and have the whole conversation if it's a quick thing, and then hang up before uh, Trasser answered? Or do I leave it to ring out in case Trasser answered any second? So I decided to pick it up, picked it up, said hello. There's no one there. It was like it was a prank call. Said hello again, no answer. So I gave him a load of abuse. He fucking murdered. I got quite angry. Uh, put it down, looked back at the screen, and it was me ringing myself because I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> So, yeah, well, cool, eh? Ring myself up to give myself some abuse. I want to do that, just ring Sky or Get it out of your system. Oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's an efficient way of, you know, giving and receiving abuse. Doesn't need to involve anyone else. No one does that, yeah. If you're ever angry, give it a go. Um, I'm going to do another family poem. I'll do one about my dad. Uh, and it starts off, just to set the scene, at the beginning of this poem. Um, I'm hiding from when it's time to go to bed. Has, any, has anyone here ever hidden when it was time to go to bed? Yeah? Yeah, you want to prolong how long you can stay? Maybe. Right, I was doing it because I was little and I wanted my bedtime to be as late as possible. If you're hiding now when it's time to go to bed, like maybe from your partner, it's probably not a good sign. It's, uh, <laughs> David, it's bedtime. Fuck. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> or perhaps get not. Getting curtains and stuff, like I did when I was a kid. Probably end that relationship. Start a new thing. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm hiding behind the curtain because it's bedtime. I didn't seem to realise at the time. All of all of me and my brothers and sisters did this. I was one of seven. Um, didn't seem to realise at the time. Hiding behind a curtain in the dark in your pajamas uh, is pretty shit. Uh, compared to going up to your bedroom and being able to chat and play with your brothers and sisters. But anyway, that's how it starts. This one's about my dad, it's called Dad. <laughs> I'm stood, stuck still, on the windowsill. It's seven o'clock. Hiding behind a curtain certainly won't be found in the same spot as I hid in last night. Not when I've turned the lights off. I was hiding purely for the excitement of discovery. Once uncovered, I'd happily scamper upstairs to my slumber. Once you'd kissed me through the banisters, and I'd wiped it off straight afterwards. Even when I've been bad, you insisted on that kiss. Even after harsh arguments, you'd target us all with those lips, just in case you weren't there in the morning, and we'd be stuck with guilty thoughts that you couldn't fix. But we'd wake the next day to your nose blowing like a foghorn, and we'd stretch and yawn to your household cockcrow, a small shift in pitch as you switched between nostrils. A two-note symphony and blocking any obstacles to your lung deep discussion with the world. <laughs> At Nan's 80th birthday, Uncle Bill answered the door. And by force of habit, I tiptoed to kiss him, but he scorned he wouldn't have it. Men do not kiss men. You replied, they're doing my house, Bill. I was five then. You the one-man ilk, reveling in rebellion. Like when you outed Les, pretending to be boyfriends at the chippe. Just to provoke a reaction. The satisfaction was silly, having a laugh at folks still shocked that blokes kiss blokes. Because men should like sport and breasts and to drive cars and fix things and to iron and look after the kids and spend time in the kitchen. And when doing electrics in the attic, they should fall through the gap and then dangling half over the stairs and half over the landing, impaled on a loose nail stuck under your ribs. Musing woozily on the bright idea that now seemed quite stupid of rewiring the lighting while we were all out. You lifted yourself up off the nail, just enough to drop down from the ceiling, stop yourself bleeding, and go and make the tea before we all returned to eating. You didn't fuss. You always had at least one fresh wound. With all that blood, sharks would have loved you. Good job you couldn't swim. Bet to sunbathe in a dream haze, snoozing away in the afternoon so that for the next three days at least, stung by sunburn, you sought relief in the deep shade while we played and joked at your new look, the pink white crab stick. In a black, like reposing pouch, Mum couldn't have found romantic. But anything, I guess, to keep us like laughing. You often apologised that you were old-fashioned, 
But it's not obsolete to believe that things should still happen in a certain way. Courtship before babies. Saying please and thank you. Opening doors for ladies. Learning more than just a forename prior to fornication. Wearing a skirt that covers your bum. Imagination. Not just letting the world be imposed on us. Imposing ourselves on the world like you showed us. Conversing with correct language. Flirting with checkout girls if they'd listen to your diatribe on men. Useless dogs compared to women. They blush or smile agreement. Self-abuse your secret weapon. Knowing that you can have great sex with most people, but the mind-boggling lovemaking is something special and deeper. When you told me that, there was only one thing I could think. How funny the word boggling was. <laughs> it still is. Some things don't change. Some do. You no longer ain't kisses. And it seems harsh you no longer target us with those lips. Somehow unjust. You're not here and I'm mourning. But if you were here, I wouldn't need you here to support me. It baffles me, like it baffles some folk. The blokes kiss blokes. It's a real conundrum. The mind boggles. Thank you. One more longer poem for you. I'm going to do another short one first. Uh, this is one of my brother's poems, uh, John Burkitt's poem. It's his only bilingual poem, and the last line is in French. and goes like this: Jaguar, 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 Jaguar. Right, uh, I've got one more poem for you. Uh, don't applaud that, please don't applaud it. Uh, one more 